Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Simon Fernwitten, a Cal activist and the Individual Development Senior NCO for ARC Support Battalion. I'm so pleased to be with you today this morning and to have the opportunity to introduce Nick Gowing and Chris Langdon, who are true standouts in their field. <coughs> Nick founded the Thinking the Unthinkable project in 2014. Both are also co-authors of the Cutting Edge book, Thinking the Unthinkable, which will be available for you to purchase outside in the marquee today. Their bio was in the programme, and as you'll see, their background is extensive. They have a great appreciation for and understanding of the theme of today. They are insatiable in their pursuit of a greater understanding and mastery of change. They're also fascinating people and we're all in for a real treat. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Nick and Chris up onto the stage. Thank you very much. Is the microphone working? Can you hear me up at the top? It's cosy and intimate in here. I thought we were coming to a small gathering. This is, what, 900 or 900 seats anyway. So I'm gonna, we're going to really sort of power this at you to really uh, f make you feel like this is a grenade being thrown in the water. Chris uh, and I have written this book and done an enormous amount of research. But picking up uh, Lord Bramall, uh, when I was at the BBC until four years ago, I didn't think I'd be doing this, but the world is changing amazingly fast, which is an indication of what you've got to do. You've got to adapt and you've got to amend your perspectives. We're in the Churchill Theatre. This started because I was approached by the Churchill Foundation 50 years after his death and asked, would you do something? And this is the result. So you've got to scale up and so on. Now, Chris and I have a deal here. As we're only talking for about 20 minutes, we can't do it one word each or one paragraph each. So I'm going to give the majority of the presentation. Then we're going to take questions and talk about it afterwards and in the discussion before lunch. So I might heckle a bit, but otherwise I'll let Nick give the presentation. And I'm really interested in your questions. Do put them up on Slido. We'd love to engage. We've got about 10 minutes at the end of our session. Then at 12, there's a longer session for discussion. What you have to say is really important. We're here to listen as well as to now Nick will give his presentation. Thanks, Chris. Anyway, so I'm going to really throw it at you um, very much along the lines of thinking the unthinkable and just picking up what we heard about Lord Bramall. Um, this is, these are two important words, talking about change, and that's what we heard from the Colonel as well. But it's also the level of disruption that's going on, disruption of everything you're thinking about, how you think the unthinkable. Of course, you can't think unthinkables, but that's the problem. What is coming down the track, and how do you prepare for it and prepare for it smartly? Much of what I'm going to say with Chris is actually damn obvious. The question is how you factor it in, how bold you are. We've done an enormous amount of interviewing, an enormous amount, and everything we're saying to you is based on data of people like you and at higher levels saying, we don't like what we're seeing, we're very anxious about what we're seeing. And what is the context of all of this? Of course, you know, it is about Brexit, it is about Trump, it is about migration, it is about Russia. But it's why loser leaders are in many ways losing the plot on multiple issues. Now, in an on-the-record discussion like this, I'm sure many of you don't want to be that honest. But what's remarkable is behind closed doors how honest chief executives, chairmen, and also senior public servants have been about not just Brexit, but the enormity of what's coming down the track with AI, with the skills threat, with what is national stability. So it's not just about Brexit, Trump, migration, and Russia. But when I was doing an earlier iteration of this, in the German government, they couldn't get change. And I was asked to do this uh, with Chris, uh, with the German foreign ministry two years ago. And at the end, um, the, the senior figure, the senior civil servant, who's pretty frustrated, said, what I'm trying to get over to those here in Berlin is this. It's an end to tranquility. The assumption that the rules-based system since the end of the Second World War is going to endure, survive, and isn't under threat. That was two years ago. We all know where we are now. Now, I'm not being facetious, but there is a... There are a few issues here which I, we need to share with you, and in, including what has just happened in the midterm elections. I was at the NATO um, summit in um, Brussels in July. What was ra remarkable is that there he was swinging his, his ball, but actually if you look at the 
uh, if you look at the communique, there were 78 sections, over 22 pages, of remarkable uh, unity among the NATO allies, regardless of that wrecking ball that we see. But it's also about the framing of what I'm going to say and what Chris and I have been working on. It's the framing for you. Look at what happened at the G7 summit uh, in Quebec back in June, when uh, the view was that because of what had happened and Trump actually rejecting the communique on his plane as he left Quebec, this is in many ways the end of the West. And that's something which you've got to think about, about what is a developing country, what are emerging countries, what are the definitions that we're all using here. I think what I and Chris and all the speakers need to do, as we were asked to do at a recent big gathering of a major corporate, is somehow turn on the light bulbs to make you feel that what you are feeling privately can somehow be injected into the way you are leading whether you're public servants, uh, civil servants, or whether you're working for the military. There's a commonality here. And much of what we're saying is based on talking to people in, co in the corporate world as well. They are going through exactly the same set of problems. Um, and that's really significant. You're all in this together. There's no uniqueness to the British Army. There's no uniqueness to the British military. The corporates are scared as well in this new environment. How do they reconfigure? How do they even survive? Let me give you a reality check here. If I'd been here with Chris a year ago, we'd just about have been talking about this. How much is this factored into the way you're thinking about what's coming down the track? Me too. The implications of sexually inappropriate behavior, but the impact now there is for leaders in this environment. Things that have got, people have got away with, you can't get away with anymore. You've got to think about this unthinkable. Or is it in reality an unpalatable? Because you know it's a problem, but you don't really want to do anything about it yet. And that's what the problem has been in so many things, literally in the last 12 months, which were never being thought about. Even the Nobel Committee had to get rid of 18 people because of sexually inappropriate behavior. The Nobel Committee, that, um, uh, that icon of respectability in Sweden and Norway, being affected by this. And who would have thought what happened on Thursday last week? Google going on strike. 20,000 employees rejecting the way the company was handling sexually inappropriate um, behavior and the massive payoffs. Suddenly what they believed was literally an internal issue became a very public issue. And within minutes, the system that all of you and uh, all of us use to communicate with each other, Gmail and uh, messaging and so on, was being used internally to create a mass movement literally within minutes and unthinkable for Google. So how could they have thought about it? They should have been thinking about it. There were plenty of other bits of evidence of what was coming down the track uh, in this new environment. Similarly, other issues which could affect you because of your nat the nature of what you're doing on security, about national stability. Here in Cape Town earlier this year, Cape Town almost running out of water. There are 10 major cities around the world, including London, which are uh, water scarce, you may be asked to somehow work out what, how uh, a city like London can be kept afloat because uh, in Cape Town, they were literally having to work out how to provide water to six million people from 200 standpoints. Now that was a part of, uh, as much about politics as anything else, but it shows the level of unthinkables that there are in this new environment. And there's no one here, I guess, from the Navy but when you've got the three billion new carrier sitting up at Invergordon on the Clyde and someone decides to go to Maplins and buy a drone and fly it over the flight deck um, in defiance of whatever perimeter security there was, you can see there are major issues of what are we really thinking about? Now, there is a rider to this. I'm told the Navy did want a license to stop this, but actually they were denied a license by Ofcom. And Maplins has gone bust. So that's a security uh, success. But let me try and capture, if it, some of you may be skeptical about this. Let's think more broadly. Let me encourage you through a very senior leader in the United States uh, to hear the kind of 
scambles that he's now having to work on. He employs 600,000 people. He's one of the largest companies, second or third companies uh, in the United States. Um, and this happened to be at the, in Saudi Arabia last year. Forget that, don't, let's get involved in the Saudi Arabia issue. But it's what he said and how he said it, which is so important for you to take away, to realize just how profoundly you've got to think differently and, as he says, go back to school in your thinking. Technology is affecting almost everything we know. Uh, at Blackstone, we have probably 120 companies we own at any point in time. And we employ somewhere, depending on what we own, 500 to 600,000 people. We're usually the second or third biggest employer in the United States. We have a whole range of companies, and there are many people who are here with us uh, who have similar types of, of exposures. So this is a large company that we have. Nothing remains the same. And this is a warning to all of you who live your lives and think it's going to be the same the next day. It's changing so fast whether it's the modes of distribution, you know, you can be in retailing and all of a sudden find your customers are leaving you and you have good merchandise um, because they can buy it online, they can buy your stuff online, the margin isn't big, as big. Uh, we're seeing changes in supply. Uh, it's happening everywhere. And we're sending our people, in effect, back to school so they can learn, not at the expense of making an investment and then it ends up going wrong because they didn't know what was going to happen to it. But even as more conventional investors, um, you have to learn, you have to know, or else your children won't be able to inherit businesses that you have. They'll be damaged. Nothing remains the same. This is a warning to all of you, and he wants to stay as one of the biggest companies in the United States. So that's the framing to what Chris and I are presenting to you today, based on an enormous amount of interviewing. And you'll see that our graphics are red. We think this is worth a red alert, because things are changing so fast, most people are either assuming this is a blip, or somehow we're going to get over it. I would suggest to you, we would suggest to you very strongly, this is a flawed assumption. This is about understanding the enormity of what is changing, and it ain't going to go backwards. This is Jeff Mulgan. He's the chief executive of the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and Arts. We happen to be seeing him tomorrow, formerly number 10. But he um, has a, a, an important phrase for you to take away today. It's about the price, the cost now, of zombie orthodoxies. And underpinning the last 10 or 15 minutes of what we can talk about here is how much you're prepared to challenge everything, including in a top-down environment like the British Army or any military organization, how much you need to challenge, not in an offensive way, but have you thought about this? Zombie orthodoxies. This is about the human capacity, the vulnerabilities and the frailties at the very highest levels to first appreciate and then embrace the impact and implications of the new levels of disruption and uncertainty. We've done that before, but is it still relevant? Are we still thinking about the West? Bad idea, because so much is changing. The words we're using, we say advisedly, based on what people are telling us. These are now existential threats. Existential threats to government and governance, and it is about a new normal, how you define it, whether it's change or disruption. And what you've seen with Brexit, which we predicted two years ago, the, the referendum result, we also predicted Trump's nomination and Trump's uh, election uh, in, in the world today for Chatham House. This is not just about Brexit. This is about a pushback, as we call it, not populism, a pushback against the system. That's why we'd say government and governance, because there are those out there in society who are saying, we don't like what we see, we don't trust you anymore to do it. And that's going to underpin my uh, remarks for the next 10 or 15 minutes, because it, it is the scale of what is happening. And the main conclusion we've got, and I'm going to say this slowly, the conformity 
which gets you and qualifies you to the top. In many ways now disqualifies you from appreciating the enormity of what is changing, the level of disruption, and then what to do about it, the conformity which gets you to the top, the qualifications. So the, the thrust, building on what Lord Bramwell has said, is how you inject that into a system without it seeming offensive or subversive, but in a very productive and a positive way, which is why we say you can actually thrive on change. This is not about pessimism. It's about realism, and surely that's what good leadership is about. It's about assessing, as you do in the field. It's about assessing the, assessing the dangers and what you're trying to achieve, and then working out how to get there. And in the battlefield, things are changing all the time and damn fast. As I'm the first person with Chris to speak, let me reinforce this message, because here's your new chief of defense. We have a chapter on the work he was doing in the British Army for four years, which qualified him to get to the top uh, from June. But it's the language which is important to frame what you're thinking about today and, and, and further. It's about the true difficulties, as he told us in a couple of interviews, of defense's ability to be able to adapt to change and to challenge to adapt. That's a challenge for you from your new chief of defense. And it is about a world which is changing around us. And it is uh, about the dilemma here, the challenge of an institution where people have to argue and they have to debate until a decision is made and then obey orders. And that's coming from your boss, subject to political um, uh, acceptance. And let me reinforce that again. Uh, with what happened at the Land Warfare Conference. I'm on the trust, uh, one of the trustees of the Royal United Services Institute with Lord Haig, former Foreign Secretary, who's our chairman. But it's the kind of language he was using with your new CGS, Mark Carlton Smith, three days into his job, um, three weeks after he was appointed. There is Lord Haig saying, it's a fragmentation of the West that is disruptive of international relations and your new head of the army, the darkening geopolitical picture, unstable times, the world has never been more unpredictable. So probably everything and much of what you've got ingrained, that conformity, is simply not relevant or not as appropriate to what you now need to do. And the challenge here at Cal and beyond is how you inject that into your system very effectively. But I want to emphasize you are not alone. Literally, a week ago, Chris and I were here in the Guildhall. This is about a, a new initiative which has been going for two years from the British Academy. Quite a stuffy organization, the most distinguished academics in social sciences in the United Kingdom. But they've started a program, which Chris has been more involved in than me, on the future of the corporation. This was a week ago in Guildhall. There you can see reforming business in the 21st century. In the bottom right is Colin Mayer, Professor Colin Mayer from the Said Business School. And obviously I can't repeat exactly what he said, which he did all um, without notes. But what we're talking about is a mistrust in business, which is profound, pervasive, and persistent. And what you're beginning to see in the corporate world is a corporate world which begins to realize now that capitalism as we know it, without purpose, is under threat. It's a bit like your mission as well. Uh, uh, and the kind of language we heard from other people in that room, similar to you sitting here uh, a week uh, later, is how to bring about change. And here's one of the CEOs saying, in the interests of business are now at odds with the interests of society. And before the end of uh, our remarks here, I want to sort of go into that and something which will impact on you. But how do you as leaders handle all of this? We've got over 500 interviews. Almost every one of them has remained confidential and no one wants to speak publicly because it's a brand, a reputation, a pension, um, status, threat. If you say, we're in trouble here, I, we've got a problem with leadership. But here's Ian Conn, who's the chief executive of Centrica, which runs British Gas, which supplies a lot of your gas under enormous pressure because of capping from the government. Totally unexpected, but it's happening, and the gas price has gone up twice this year. But this is what a senior leader, a former senior figure in BP, is saying publicly and not withdrawing. It's all moving too fast. It's revolution. It's not evolution. There are many accelerations at once. One of the biggest problems is the difficulty of how to mankind can cope with it. I don't know whether political leaders or business leaders can easily handle it. That's a very brave, but a very important, open thing to be saying. 
So the context is changing. You ultimately report to the, the regent, to the king or the queen. Uh, that's your role in, 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 uh, in, in the British Army. Um, but there is also another major factor out there, which is society. And that I would put to you is becoming, as we saw with the decision not to go ahead with airstrikes in uh, Syria after the, um, after the poison gas in August five years ago, and when the public took a different view from number 10. We're seeing changes which are difficult to inject still into the systems that you represent. Here is um, Stephen Fry in a, in a very um, expansive um, lecture he gave talking about this is now the greatest change to our way of living. Here's the Astronomer Royal, uh, Lord Martin Rees, who's also got a fantastic book, um, which has just come out, um, which you also ought to get a hold of. It's not here, but it's, it's well worth it. He's the Astronomer Royal. He's also running the Center for Existential Risk in Cambridge, talking about the big challenge to governance. And there's a third fascination here. You may hate my former business of being a me the media, the bloody media, as I used to say in many presentations. But Jeremy Vine on Radio, on Radio 2 has got some fantastic um, new data nodes to share with you. He's been on air now on Radio 2 for 15 years. He reckons he's done 25,000 uh, interviews on air. And this is the kind of c conclusion he's now come to about the relationship between the public and those in positions of power and responsibility. The listeners are now in control. The listeners tell me the news. They run it now. The elite has been upended. And you're part of the elite the, in the public perception. The elite has been upended. The credibility, and that's what pushbackism and what Chris and I have labeled the populism, which you talk about probably, it's different. It's a pushback against those in power who are not delivering the, what those in positions in, in society are feeling they should be delivering. And I'll come to one conclusion on that at the end. This is an enormous challenge that you've entered into by coming here today. And I, I applaud what you're doing, not for inviting us, but for, for doing this kind of gathering, because there are many others who could benefit from this. But the scale of the challenge was brilliantly pulled together for us by Chris Donnelly, who's director of the Institute for Statecraft, well known here at Sandhurst, formerly advisor at NATO, brilliant military historian, but also very shrewd on strategy. But he said this to us two years ago. The rate of change we're going through at the moment is comparable to what happens in wartime. Yet we think we're at peace. The global pace of change is overcoming the capacity of national and international institutions. Those phrases, comparable to what happens in wartime, the destabilization, the unpicking of what we all assume is solid and giving us what we need and what we want and society expects, wealth included, overcoming the capacity of national and international institutions. It's this kind of environment that we're talking about. Now we can talk facetiously about how big the room is and what is there. There are black swans. They have them in Australia and New Zealand. They don't have them anywhere else. The black swans, the Nicholas Taleb, black swans. We can talk about what is in here, but you don't see it. The, the, the black elephant as well. And NATO has a third one, which is um, the black jellyfish. Um, they call it the toxic um, kind of impact on that. But when you what bring all that... You do when you don't expect it. Yes. When you bring all that together, as uh, CDS has done, he has a great phrase which we've adopted, which is the scale of the challenge now is so enormous, how as a leader do you handle this when you have to eat an elephant in one mouthful? Because the level and scale of the agenda of change and disruption is so enormous with so many uncertainties of which way it's going and how. Let me move on to sort of what you can take away before Margaret takes over. It's about thinking this through, working it through either in small groups, larger groups, being open and honest about it. You need a new awareness of this for a start. You need new thinking, you need new attitudes, new culture, you need new mindset and behavior, receptiveness, to modify what you do and how you do it at the top. Because if you stick in your lane, you're going to be stuck in something which becomes irrelevant, makes you irrelevant, and also probably makes you uh, feel uh, quite unwanted by those around you, particularly from the next generation who have a very different attitude to leadership to those at the top who've made it to the top who are quite defensive about how they got there and why they're there. Um, central to this is the timeline for unthinkables. It is 
not what you think. Let's think about this for 2012, for, for, for 2020, or well, 2032 or something, 10 years. You've got to think about what's happening coming down the track now. Um, that's why I put up there what the, the, um, the, the Me Too movement. Um, it's not about even 10 months, it's probably about 10 weeks, 10 days, 10 hours, or even 10 minutes. And you might say, well, we're going to have, we're going to think about our, our, our strategy for 2030. Well, I would be facetious and say this very strongly. 2030 is actually nine hours from now. It isn't, um, it isn't 12 years. It's how you are going to adapt to that, not 10 years away or 12 years away, but how you're going to adapt to it now. And in so many ways, you ain't seen anything yet. We're just in the foothills of disruption and change. And you are in those foothills, moving into a leadership a position or with your leadership positions, the foothills of a massive mountain of challenges, most of which are not known about at the moment, because of algorithms, and Chris has been doing much more work than me on this, because of artificial intelligence, the replacement of human beings by AI, invading our existence, as one chief executive told us, blockchain and Bitcoin as well. But this brings us to the, where we want to leave you for this part of it. It's about the hollowing out of the middle class. The hollowing out of the middle class and how that's going to, um, going, going to be managed. How do you manage this in the new environment where many people who have good jobs won't have them in the future, whether you're lawyers, whether you're accountants, whether you're back office people um, in the city, because most of those jobs are going to be replaced by robots and algorithms. That's an enormous social challenge into which you, as part of the security environment, have to think about. Now, I have talked to the National Security Advisor, and even though we're, we're on the record here, about the possibility that National Security Advisor should actually be National Stability Advisor. Because of the challenges, not from Russian missiles in Kaliningrad, or the trolls in St. Petersburg, or in, 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 uh, in, in Shanghai, but for other things as well. And there's a very sobering remark here from one senior leader, Joe Kazab, who's the chief executive, the global chief executive and the president of Siemens, the major global engineering company doing far better than GE, which does have its existential threats. And I'm now going to read as, my final, as our final remarks just how fast and how fearful many at the top are. Joe Kazab had told us this kind of thing two or three years ago, which helped us frame our research but we couldn't say it because he didn't want it to become public. Now he's gone public, and he's reflecting what others are saying in public as well, which should condition the context in which you are thinking about this. If we get the revolution right, digitization will benefit nearly 10 billion people around the world. If we get it wrong, societies will be divided into winners and losers. Social unrest and anarchy will arise, the glue that holds societies and communities together will disintegrate and citizens will no longer believe that governments are able to fulfill their purpose of enforcing the rule of law and providing security. That's tough stuff. If you're a conformist, then you will be saying, well, actually, you know, the political system is in pretty good shape. We've got political parties and so on. Um, so, you know, what's the problem? But then when you look around and you look at the kind of things that have happened in places like France with Macron, he's in trouble at the moment because even he who decimated much of the traditional politics of France, he is now accused of not delivering within the time frame that the public expected. And similarly, you know what has happened to uh, Angela Merkel. But she failed to understand the enormity of the impact of migration. It was an unthinkable. It's an unthinkable which has really changed dramatically German traditional politics. Look at what happened in the Hesse election and the Bavarian election in the last three weeks. The rise of the Green Party suddenly. Suddenly even the traditionalists are thinking the current parties don't deliver. And I would put it on the record, probably we're going to face that in this, in this country as well, including because of Brexit. And you're seeing it in Poland, you're seeing it in Hungary, you're seeing it in Italy at the moment. The glue that holds together the assumptions of what we've all grown up with ain't there and ain't guaranteed anymore. So um, these are the 
things we wanted to put on your agenda to think about, to make you feel comfortable, relaxed, have a good coffee, good, <laughs> good, good um, break, and a nice lunch, and it's a great day out there. And you can go away and say, I was shocked and I was made feel, to feel very uncomfortable by Gowing and Langdon. But we can say this to you because you were going to have responsibility for handling this. And you've got the responsibility to think about it. And so my final thought is this. In this new environment, and, and Justin's coming up, Colonel Justin's coming, how wacky are you prepared to be? Because within the conformist system, if you're wacky, you're kind of written off. Actually, if you're wacky, there's a good chance you're wise. Similarly, we've heard it. That idea is bonkers. Actually, it's probably bold. And that's what's needed in this new environment. No, that person's got no career prospects. They're a bit of a maverick. Actually, you need mavericks in this environment because mavericks tend to be visionaries. They may have trouble somehow projecting it, but that's what, what is needed in this new environment. And finally, um, no, that's a stupid idea. Probably a stupid idea is actually a sage insight. And the next generation are providing a lot of important new insights. And what we see time and time again is the struggle they're having to get through the leadership ladder, the conformist ladder. And many of them in the corporate world are saying, I don't want that anymore. That's why there's an existential threat even to major corporates. The four big um, accounting and consultant firms are having problems now get persuading people to become partners because they don't want the leadership responsibility. So we leave that thought with you and making you feel incredibly comfortable. Um, and uh, Margaret Heffernan will talk about willful um, uh, resonant, uh, dissonance. Willful. Willful blindness. Willful blindness and dissonance, and the kind of things that we've been, talk we've been discovering uh, about, about, about sc leaders being scared, being overwhelmed, and worried about the short term. And the Colonel is here with your questions. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I've got the unenviable job of trying to keep speakers to time uh, today. Um, we're we're going to take uh, questions after each of the speakers via Slido to try and make the most uh, get through. That said, uh, we've only really got time within this slot for one immediate question here. We do have a panel session at the end of the morning uh, where all the speakers will be available for other, for other questions. Uh, and Nick and Chris will also be in the marquee afterwards uh, to answer any other questions. So um, I'm going to jump straight to uh, the question which is, seems to be most popular uh, in the audience. Um, Nick, Chris, uh, we are in an era of accelerating change. Society is changing much more quickly than the past and technology faster. And that's from an army paper in 1986. What is different now? The speed of change, the transparency, and the implications of the technologies in thinking of uh, genome editing. We'll be able to change our bodies in the future. Things that were talked about in science fiction books in 86, 87, are things that are already being thought about by scientists. And what we now need to think about is what is the role of ethicists, public, public figures, uh, 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 academia, philosophers, people with the armed forces, thinking about what is going to be the nature of the future. Those technologies, we, we talked to some of the best professors Nick mentioned in Cambridge, also Oxford, some of the top centers also in London and around the world. There are a huge number of changes which are really of a bigger scale than those that were around in the 80s. And that's what we need to prepare for and think about. And there's a very good paper by Jeff Mulgan, who Nick name checks, looking about how we need to have a national conversation on a whole series of these things. I can hear from the discussion we had last night, there's some very interesting conversations happening with the armed forces and we're very glad to be here. It's how we start to deliberate on the implication of the scale of the changes that are going to be happening over the next, next few years. But there is an internal question there about why uh, there wasn't more resonance. I mean, in 1986, when you think back to where we were in 1986, um, uh, the wall hadn't come down. I was in Eastern Europe during all of that time. No, I was with Nigel Broomfield, who died last week, the ambassador in East Germany. The night before the wall came down, I was sitting with him in the Grand Hotel in Berlin, and no one expected what would happen. So there are unthinkables which will happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it does raise an important, uh, an important question. You can go away and ignore everything that we've said, but we see this now as an important part of a process and a community. And one of the reasons we've raised some of the other people who are doing this is there's something building now uh, as seen as a, because of the existential threat, the existential threat to our way of life. And I could have quoted CDS from um, uh, uh, last year's Rusi lecture before he went off to NATO, um, uh, Air, Chief Mar um, Air Chief Marshal Stuart Peach, he, Sir Stuart Peach. He said, 
we are now seeing a serious threat to our way of life. And he wasn't just talking about uh, Russian sub mini submarines uh, examining the uh, undersea cables and gas pipelines across the North Sea. A serious threat to our way, a very serious threat to our way of life. And so I would suggest, uh, Colonel, that what you're seeing is it is surfacing now, surfacing in a productive way. And actually, that's why we've agreed to come here, because this is a part of that process in a way which probably didn't exist in 1986. We'd love to continue the conversation. Here are our contacts. We do have a few books, for sure. But we'd, if you'd like to get in touch with us in the future, do so. We claim no monopoly of wisdom, but we've got, I think we have some interesting insights from our interviews. And you're going to have fascinating uh, insights now with Margaret and with David and with John. So I think we should have a fascinating conversation today. Great. Nick, Chris, thank you. Uh, greatly for starting the conference off in such a fantastic fashion and really laying out the context for us. Um, before I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in thanking Nick and Chris, um, we're going to take a five minutes, very deliberate five minute pause now uh, to stretch your legs in place. We're going to try something slightly different because we're going to stick to timings here. Um, on the Slido, there is a poll section which is now open. In this five minute break, please turn to the person to your left, your right, in front, behind, and just pull out the one key observation from that talk for you that most resonates for either you personally or you as an organization. Enter it as a single sentence or two sentences in the poll section on Slido, and then when we come back at the end of the second speaker, uh, we'll then be giving out a signed copy of the book uh, to, the, to the person that has uh, come up with the best sentence. Um, please join me in thanking Nick and Chris for a fantastic start to the morning. Okay.